Hello, my A-Push children. Welcome to Chapter 13, The Impending Crisis. We're about to get to the Civil War. This is one chapter to it, basically what started it off. Forgive me for sounding plugged up. Um, I'm just going to have to deal with it. Section 1 of these notes today, we're going to be looking at moving westward. The idea of manifest destiny, that pride in America that we were destined, God had destined us to expand our country and move westward. Well, it, it extended the idea of liberty, it extended through our um, social system, but as you know, at the time we were kind of racist and we thought, well, this way we can take over the bad, dark people at the time, which is just ridiculous. But um, not everybody agreed with it. Henry Clay, for instance, thought it might increase tension expanding west. I don't know what he'd be talking about. It's not like we had a civil war or anything. <laughs> One of the places that many immigrants wanted to move to was, was Texas, and the United States government encouraged it. Mexico was offering cheap land, and they thought it was a great way to not only spur the economy and increase tax revenues, but also to be a buffer against the Indians. So thousands took this deal. They realized, yes, there's, there's great land there for cotton, and then all we're seeing that there's more Americans there than actual Mexicans, so that's going to become a problem later on. So I'm sure you've heard before that everything's different in Texas, and Texas is basically like its own country. Well, it actually was for a while. They were starting to have some weren't there little fights with Mexico over land because, I don't know, Mexico actually did something moral and outlawed slavery when all they kept doing was bringing more and more slaves into the uh, state of Mexico. So, in 1830, General uh, Antonio Lopez de Santa Ana he actually took over, he was the dictator, and he's like, I'm having national control over this, they can't have slaves, and Texas is like, no, I don't really care, we're just going to become our own independent nation. So from 1836 until 1845, we are going to see that Mexico is in itself its own country. Now Mexico didn't recognize this, and they fought them, and they killed them in the Battle of the Alamo during this time period, but then they fought back, and um, Sam Houston helped defeat the Mexicans in 1836 in the Battle of San Jacinto, um, and then they signed a treaty with Santa Ana making Texas independent, so then they recognized it. Now, some Texans didn't want to be annexed by the United States, but there were so many people who were against it because of the fact that if you gave in and allowed Texas to be part of the United States, it's another state that would be a slave-holding state, and that made people in the North Pole nervous because that meant that that would give more Southerners power in Congress. Some people feared this controversy and chose to kind of ignore it. Andrew Jackson ignored it, Martin Van Buren, even uh, President Harrison, when he was alive for that whole month as president, ignored it as well. Texas, even Europe, was getting involved in this too. They were like, hey, we don't want them to become part of the United States. Let's try to keep them their own country. So they were trying to get involved. That freaked us out a little bit. President Tyler, when he got in office, was like, let's annex them. Let's have them reapply for statehood. And they did in 1844. And what happened? The Senate rejected them. So we're not really sure if they were going to become a part of the country or not. All right, next we're going to talk about Oregon. First, Texas, now Oregon. Now, here's the deal. We claimed we had it, and so did Great Britain. So what did we decide to do? Have joint occupation. We shared it, but just like little kids should always do. And why do we even want to be there? Well, we basically wanted to be there for the simple fact that we wanted to convert Indians to become Christians, and we didn't want those Canadian Catholics getting their hands on them. We, of course, wanted the Protestants to, because according to our beliefs back then, only Protestants were the ones that knew Christianity. So we start seeing that happen, but then in the 1840s, we start seeing a huge amount of Americans move into Oregon, um, and they're starting to outnumber the Great Britain, uh, Great Britain settlers. So it's, we're seeing that, we're seeing the native population be destroyed and moved out, and basically the American population taking over this area. So by the mid-1840s, we're starting to see Oregon want to be in it. What type of people are moving out west? Well, southerners were moving mainly to Texas, and those from the old northwest, which is known as the Midwest today, were moving out there um, more to California. The Oregon areas, why? For economic opportunity. They wanted uh, the riches, they wanted the American dream. Um, some of them went to California to discover gold, because they were being gold in those mines, and then other ones wanted to find cheap land, other ones wanted to do so for religious purposes, like the Mormons. There are several trails at the time that people took. They took the Mormon Trail, the Santa Fe Trail, the Oregon Trail, um, and, and they would have, like, these depots along the trails to be able to stop at to, like, gather supplies or do whatever they needed to do. It was a great economic opportunity for people who ran the depots. They could make money off of people going on these trails out west. It was pretty tough getting out there. You know, you had the desert, you had the mountains. A lot of people were 
absolutely afraid of having Indian attacks, which really didn't occur that often. More so, we saw peaceful interactions with Indians with their purity. So if you've ever played the game Oregon Trail, you kind of have an idea of what was going on and that the game was pretty legit. Next, we're going to focus on Section 2, which is about expansion and war. Uh, when it came to the Democrats in expansion, they kind of wanted it, but, you know, the other, the Whigs were the ones that were a little bit against it, but the Democrats really, really wanted it. Um, so in 1844, the Democrats ran James K. Polk against uh, Henry Clay, and he won. Uh, he won because of the fact that he wanted to annex both Oregon and Texas. Therefore, he appealed to both the Northerners and the Southerners when it came to uh, appealing to both areas in the North and the South. Um, outgoing President John Tyler, he saw this election as a mandate, meaning like he had to annex Texas, so he did it so in 1845. But then when Polk got into office, he's like, well, I am going to propose to annex Oregon at the 49th parallel and move it up the northern border of the United States. We wanted to move that up to the 54th, 40 parallel. Great Britain refused. They didn't want to give up that much land between them and Canada. So it led the U.S. and Polk's campaign slogan to cry, 50 for 40 or fight. Basically, they're like, if you don't move it up there, we're going to fight you. Well, Great Britain gave in, and, and that's where we got the Canadian border for the United States. All right, so now we're having some issues in the southwest in California. Again, these are areas either Texas or that Mexico control. So James, President Polk, he just signed the treaty with Oregon. He's like, hi, 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 that's whatever. Just give it to us. I don't even care. Because he was really worried about the southwest because we were having some border disputes of Texas and um, Mexico. We were not only realizing that we were having some disputes between us and where we felt like who should control the Rio Grande, but uh, we were also having some disputes with um, where New Mexico was and where Mexico, those borders were. They invited the uh, many Americans to come into that area, but then they're starting to settle there. And they're saying, well, we want to annex this part of Mexico into the United States, too. They invited us here. We might as well just take it and annex it. And that was going to have some major issues with Mexico. So President Polk knew that there was a chance that we were going to be fighting with Mexico. So he said, he sent uh, General Zachary Taylor down south, and he said, okay, you take care of this, and make sure everything's okay. And then he also ordered the Navy to seize any California ports that they had control over just in case there was going to be a war with Mexico, which, as we will find out, there's going to be. All right, so we're going to have war, and it is not the Mexican-American War. For now on, no, that is just the Mexican War. Polk attempted diplomacy. He tried to send troops down to try to buy some of Mexico's land from them, and they refused, and Mexico rejected, so therefore he sent General Zachary Taylor's army from the Nueces River to the Rio Grande in order to fight in January 1846. So in May 1846 is when we officially declared war on Mexico. The Whigs were major critics of it. They said that it was bad, it was going to cost a lot of money, it cost a lot of lives, but the Democrats pushed and Polk pushed on with it. Now, it started where we, we were very successful in capturing um, northeastern Mexico. Polk offered um, the offensive to basically go after New Mexico and California, and it was done under the leadership of Colonel Stephen Kearney, who took both Santa Fe and part of California with the uh, Bear Flag Revolution. Uh, Mexico still refused to cede defeat to Polk, so he sent uh, General Winfield Scott down to capture Mexico City, and he took control of Mexico City while they had a new government in that basically decided to negotiate a treaty, a treaty with the United States. Uh, we were at the time thinking of taking all of Mexico, but we just decided that we wanted to end this war really quickly, so we refused to do that. So President Polk sent down a special envoy with Nicholas Trist, running the show and trying to make a settlement. Well, we had won all this land in Mexico, and Chris came back. He's like, oh, President Polk, I got such a good deal. I got them to give us California and New Mexico and the Rio Grande border. We just had to pay him $15 million. And Polk's like, what are you doing? You're crazy. We want it. We don't have to pay them for it. But he's like, fine, whatever. Just get it over with. I just want this done. So he agreed to it. Section 3, we're going to look at the sectional debate. Now that we've expanded our country uh, from East Coast to West Coast, we've got to figure out what we're going to do with this land. Uh, Representative David Wilmot created the Wilmot Proviso, which was this idea that basically prohibited slavery in any of the new territories we got from Mexico that did not pass. It got shut down. Uh, Polk decided that he would just extend that Missouri Compromise line all the way to the West Coast. There was also the alternative plan to do popular sovereignty, let when states, when territories become states, let them choose what they want to do. 
um, in 1848, Polk decided not to run for a third term. You know, he wanted to follow the precedent set by President Washington, where he only run for two terms. It's a very novel idea. You know, um, it's very important for presidents to understand that they really should only be serving for two terms because only good presidents know that you serve for two terms or less. Um, now, who ran in 1848? It was Zachary Taylor for the Whigs versus Lewis Cass for the Democrats. And actually, for the Free Soil Party, they asked to have Martin Van Buren run again. So he ran, was trying to run again, but it didn't work out for him. Um, basically, who got elected during this time? It was General Zachary Taylor. He was a war hero. People like that. The sectional debate also had to do with California. In 1848, there was a huge gold rush. People were like, what? There's new gold in those hills? So they start moving out there. Um, and then they get there in 19, 1849, which makes them known as the 49ers. There's this huge rush out there. Now, it led to not only many Americans moving out west, but many immigrants from China coming into the country looking for the same opportunities. But the good thing is, even though a lot of people didn't find gold, there were opportunities for work anyway. It created opportunities, you know, to create hotels or living spaces or have construction jobs, whatever. They also had people who were Indian hunters at the time. That was another job they created out there, unfortunately. Uh, most didn't find gold, like I said, but um, California's agriculture agri uh, became an agrarian society a little bit out there. There was a huge, diverse population of people. We had Americans, European, Europeans, Chinese, Mexicans, free blacks, saves from southern migrants. Basically, there were so many different types of people out there with so many different ideas that led to major tensions and uh, tumultuous issues that they were having with all these different groups, so they really wanted a stable government, and they realized they had enough people that they could form it. President Taylor felt that statehood was absolutely necessary in the territories because the national government controlled the states, but then when a state became a state, the state governments could control them, and then they could decide whether or not to have slavery. It's the idea of popular sovereignty. Uh, he proposed that that happened with California and New Mexico in 1849. He figured maybe by having two go at the same time, it might split up, but People were still a little nervous about that 15-15 split going towards the um, California going free, and they were afraid by California going free that it would, it would make that balance go off. So there were tensions that were starting to increase, especially in the South. There is much debate over the Compromise of 1850. Henry Clay proposed this, basically admitting California as a new state, and that there would be um, restrictions for uh, new sl slave codes and slave fugitive slave laws. Well, the first phase of the debate was debated over by the old school um, politicians, which include K Clay, Webster, Calhoun, and they didn't just debate on the compromise, they were really debating on the issue of slavery. Um, and then after Clay's proposal was defeated, they still kept debating over it and the issue of slavery, but it was more the newer, younger, upcoming politicians that were debating it, including William, Se uh, William Seward of New York, who was an abolitionist, who basically opposed the compromise altogether, and he's eventually going to become um, Abraham Lincoln's Secretary of State. Jefferson Davis, who is of uh, Mississippi, who is going to become the um, president of the Confederate States of America, he saw slavery in terms of the South's economic self-interest. They're like, look, we need it because it's going to help our economy. And then Stephen Douglas got up and was, of course, proposing popular sovereignty, as we will talk about later. But President Taylor died in 1850 and while in office, so uh, Fillmore became president, and he supported the compromise. So he got the Northern Whigs to rally behind him. Um, so Stephen Douglas proposed to uh, Henry Clay that the compromise be split off into certain pieces where you vote on a little bit at a time. So ultimately it did get passed, but it was more about self-interest. It really wasn't about the broad ideals of slavery and um, whether or not to get rid of it. Section 4 talks about the crisis of the 1850s, and we're going to start seeing the stuff hit the fan. Uh, we're going to start seeing this in 1852, where there's an election. It is Democrat um, Franklin Pierce versus the Whig General Winfield Scott, and then the Free Soil had uh, the Free Soil Party had John Hale. Now the Whigs had a lot of abolitionists, but because the Free Soil Party was starting to explode and have such um, national prominence, they actually just jumped ship from the Whig Party, and that really hurt their chances of winning. So Franklin Pierce did become president, and he tried to ignore it. People were like, uh, what are you going to do about this slavery issue and westward expansion and the tensions between the North and South? He's like, mm. uh, 
Well, anyway, I don't know. Um, but basically, there were still many things going on. We start seeing the North have such opposition to the Fugitive Slave Acts that they refused to help anybody. And they actually, like, were attacking violently slave catchers in the North. And that really ticked off the South. So Pierce decided instead of focusing on slavery, he was going to focus on the Young America, where he's like, hey, we've got democracy spreading all over the country. This is just democracy spreading, not sectionalism and tensions and all that stuff. This is just democracy, the idea that we get to say what we want. Well, people are still upset, and they're ignoring it. They're getting really upset with him, and we're seeing more sectionalism because we see the South wanting to annex Cuba, which is pro-slave, and we see the North wanting to annex Hawaii, which is prohibiting slavery. So we're, again, we're seeing these huge tensions all because of expansion of the country. So again, we're seeing more fighting over the issue of westward expansion, this time with the railroads. We're seeing 1850 settlers beginning to move into the plain states. There's a lot of farming area that that's suitable, and we're seeing more and more people move that way. So they're, they're doing that. They're getting rid of the Indians, unfortunately. And the settlement issues that we're starting to see lead to issues over not only slavery again, but the railroads. So they're fighting over that as well because the North wants the Continental Railroad, Transcontinental Railroad to run in their area while the South wants it to run in their area. And they're deciding which area do we run it in. Do we have a major central hub of the country be it Chicago or somewhere in the South? And they're arguing over that as well. And Jefferson Davis, even who is become, going to become the president of the CSA, is going to be a part of the gets and purchase of 1853 because he's like, look at, I bought this more land, so we definitely deserve railroads done here. The North's going to get more upset about this. Again, they are going to be at each other's throats about any little issue. All right, so now we're talking about the Kansas-Nebraska controversy. Again, just more people getting upset, people trying to fix something, and it just makes it even worse. Stephen Douglas, senator from Illinois, proposed that we open up the Nebraska Territory, get rid of the Indians, let the white people in. Of course, you know, they're just putting themselves above everybody else. And uh, Nebraska was north of the Missouri Compromise Line. So they're like, well, it's free state, and people were a little upset about this. So Stephen Douglas is like, I got this great idea. It's called popular sovereignty. When these two will split the territory in two, one could be Kansas, one could be Nebraska, and when they become states, We'll let them choose whether or not they want to be free. This is popular sovereignty. They can choose if they want to be free or slave. So this was passed in 1854. President Pierce supported this. He's like, this is a great idea. But it was terrible. It had immediate sweeping consequences. First of all, it divided and destroyed the Whig Party, completely divided them. And it divided the Northern Democrats because they disagreed because... The Missouri Compromise line was gone because of this act. They basically it just disappeared. So people were very divided over this. This is even dividing people in the north. That's very bad. The, the country's divided enough already. But at the same time, we see the emergence and the beginning of the Republican Party, which is the one that still exists today. We see it starting to show up around 1854. And why did it start? Because they were against the Kansas-Nebraska Act. So now we're going to look at the issue of bleeding Kansas. So here's exactly what happens. We see settlers from the north and the south moving into Kansas. And in 1855, there were elections that southerners from Missouri traveled to Kansas to vote upon, where they created a pro-slavery legislature and legalized slavery. But there are also a big group in the, country, in the state that, that supported and wanted a free state, and they formed their own constitution and applied for statehood. So it's almost like you see two separate governments, the Lecompte Constitution and the other constitution, trying and warring against each other. Well, pro-slave forces, they were mad at the new um, free slave or free state um, government, so they burnt down this anti-slave government, and then we see retaliation, abolitionist John Brown killed five pro-slave settlers in the Potawatomi massacre, and then this led to a bunch of armed warfare between pro-slave and anti-slave forces, and this is where we see bleeding Kansas, and it was a, it was just a symbol of this sectional controversy. That's what that very first political cartoon of the whole PowerPoint was about. And it even got taken to the spores of Senate, where we see in 1856, Charles Sumner of Massachusetts gave a speech entitled The Crime Against Kansas, where he absolutely um, just tore apart, burned in effigy what was going on in Kansas, Kansas he took it out on a senator from South Carolina, and this senator's uh, nephew, Preston Brooks, who was a member of the House, got upset about it and beat Sumner in the floor, on the floor of the Senate with a cane. And they both became heroes. Sumner was a hero in the South for, for being a martyr, 
and Brooks was a hero, or Sumner was a hero in the North for being a martyr, excuse me, and Brooks was a hero in the South for taking it out on those Northerners who were saying bad things about them. Okay, with the free soil ideology, it was more about free labor than free soil. It wasn't a matter of they were morally against slavery, but they were worried that it was a threat to their white society. They were afraid that by spreading slavery to the West, it would take away job opportunities of white people in the North. Also, they were afraid of this like feudalistic, er, er, uh, aristocratic society that we saw, we saw in the South spreading across the country. They didn't want that. They thought it was a, a threat to capitalism. This was this whole slave power conspiracy. If it spread, slavery would be dominating the country, and that made them afraid. Now, this was the heart of the Republican ideology. They were committed to the Union because the growth and prosperity was central to their vision of free labor. So how did the South defend themselves, those who were pro-slavery? Well, they did it in a lot of different ways. They basically said, look, we got to take care of this because of the Nat Turner Rebellion in 1831. It was absolutely lucrative and important and, and imperative for our cotton economy in the Deep South. And because they were just afraid of the garrison abolitionists in the North, they were a threat to the society. So uh, many people, like Professor Thomas Dew, defended slavery. They basically said that the, sh the South should not apologize for having slavery. It was a good thing. Slaves had much better working conditions than those in the industrialized North, and it helped the national economy by having slavery. They also said that it was a great way of life that it was superior to any other. North was greedy, destructive, the factories were disgusting, the cities were disgusting, and the South was very stable, very orderly, they protected each other, and they also said, look, it, it's it's our religious, it, it's, it's the religious duty, slavery is in the Bible, and it's our right to protect others, and blacks were inferior to them. They felt that, like, they were inherently unfit to be able to take care of themselves. All right, 1856, we see another presidential election. We see Democrats choose James Buchanan, the Republicans choose John Fremont, and the Know-Nothings choose Millard Fillmore uh, to run again. Well, James Buchanan does one, but we're starting to see that he's a terrible president. He, the, the thing that's the worst thing about him is that he's indecisive. He can't make any strong decisions because he's very weak. Also, there was a panic and a depression at the same time, so that doesn't help that either. Um, the Republicans, though, the Republican Party in the North is strengthening because they see many people joining them, including manufacturers, workers, and farmers, and they're pretty much blaming the Southern Democrats for all the follies and all the problems with the Depression. With the Dred Scott case of 1857, we're seeing that Dred Scott, a uh, slave, was suing his master's widow for freedom because he uh, was in a free state with the master when the master died. But John Sanford, the brother of brother-in-law of deceased owner, um, just to let you know, the Supreme Court spelled his name wrong. It's it's Sanford, not Sanford, claimed ownership of Scott. Well, they, 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 this was a huge defeat in the anti-slavery movement, and here's why. Uh, Chief Justice Roger Taney said basically this. Scott didn't really have the right to bring any type of suit in a federal court because he was considered property, not a citizen. And property under the Constitution, under the Fifth Amendment, cannot be taken without due process from the owner. Therefore, Congress had no authority to pass any laws depriving citizens of slave ownership since it was their property, which basically said that the Missouri Compromise was null and void. Um, it, so basically, it said the federal government was powerless when it came to slavery. Basically, do what they want. The federal government couldn't do anything. So you're probably asking yourself, what exactly did happen to Kansas? Well, this is what happened. President James Buchanan, first of all, he endorsed the Dred Scott decision, so the Missouri Compromise is off the table, can't use that. And to solve the Kansas problem, he basically said this, yep, they're coming in as a slave state, I've decided. Well, the new uh, Kansas Constitution, it did legalize slavery, but there was an election of a new legislator that pretty much were all anti-slavery people. They were majority, and they said, we don't want it. They rejected the Constitution. Well, James Buchanan pressured Cong Congress to still admit them, even though they didn't have a ratified constitution in Kansas. Congress rejected it. They're like, no, we're not passing this. And Kansas is like, well, we're not going to have a new constitution. We do not promote this as a free, as a slave state. We want it to be free. So nothing really got done. James Buchanan was still wavering. Eventually, they did become a free state when they pretty much asked to join in 1861. We see several southern states secede. And they're like, we went into the Union, and we went in as a free state. All right, so there's this guy that's coming around. <sighs> it's Abraham Lincoln. Just love him. He's my buddy. He's my, he's my kindred soul. And he's emerging right now. How does he emerge? He's been kind of around, but this is where he gets on the national scale, when he ran against Stephen Douglas in 1858 for the Illinois U.S. Senate seat. Uh, they had debates, and basically this is what he said about slavery. Listen, it's morally wrong 
but there's really nothing that we can do about it. And you know what? We need to tr- we need to uh, know that black people aren't property. They actually are humans. And if we're going to treat if we don't treat them like humans, might as well not treat immigrants like humans either if you're going to say that. They're all humans. We might not be racially equal yet, but they're humans. Now, I understand that slavery cannot end. There's really no alternative for it. It's wrong, but there's no other choice, so we have to have it. But it doesn't have to expand. If it expands, it's going to hurt the poor white worker who might want a job out west. So he said, it'll just, it'll die off. It, you know, it will go away. I'm against it, but I can't support abolitionism because there's just no other, other alternative. Um, Douglas did win, but Lincoln in general, you know, he won the seat, but Lincoln did get a good thing out of it. He gained a national notoriety. All right, let's talk about John Brown again. He was trying to lead lead a slave uprising in Virginia. He uh, captured a fort in Harper's Ferry, Virginia, in the hopes of doing that, but it never came to fruition. And he was uh, he surrendered. He was tried for treason, and he was hanged. Now the Southerners started freaking out. They're like, "Oh my gosh, the Republican Party supported this. They knew about it, and all the Northerners are all crazy like that. And what happened to slave uprisings? They didn't know it was just an extremist, but it started freaking him out. And of course, that fear spread." All right, the presidential election of 1860 saw many divisions. We see first the Democrats split into two. We've seen the Southern Democrats who wanted strong endorsements of slavery and Western Democrats who wanted popular sovereignty. The Southern Democrats supported uh, John Breckinridge of Kentucky, while the rest of them supported Stephen A. Douglas for president. Uh, There was a constitutional union party who basically kept silent about slavery, and they picked John Bell. And then, of course, the Republicans chose Abraham Lincoln. Um, they were basically ran on the f- platform that they wanted to um, make sure to keep the country together. They, they ran on the platform of enduring high t- uh, endorsing high tariffs. They wanted to have internal improvement. They passed the Homestead Bill, which would give people free land out west, um, create the Pacific Railroad. They were okay with popular sovereignty, but um, Congress nor territory legislators could legalize the territories. Um, Slavery in the territories. They were against it. They were against free, you know, they were free slaves. Uh, why'd they choose Abraham Lincoln? Because he was moderate. He was very moderate. He was relatively, relatively obscure, and they were hoping to get some Western votes and him being out West. Um, he won the majority of the electoral votes, but only two-fifths of the popular votes. So you could tell how divided the country was. And this was the final straw. This was the cu- straw that broke the camel's back with the Southerners. And this is when we start seeing, and this starting in December, just one month later, states starting to secede from the Union. So next up, Civil War. Thorson torched out.